Good morning. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the good news. The Bills are in the AFC Championship game today. <laughs> I don't think it's out of bounds to ask for divine favor. Um, I'm not saying Kansas City are worse sinners than the Buffalo Bills, but Kansas City could be generous today, right? They've already got a Super Bowl trophy. Um, really grateful you're here, both uh, in the room and online today. I'm glad that you're joining us and that we're taking time not just to be attentive to what's going on around us, but to give attention to what God is doing in us. There's so few moments for that kind of thing to happen left in our world right now. And so this is a big deal. So Father, um, we are tired by so many things and we are tired from so many things. And uh, Briah just told us and prayed that we would enter into your rest. Would you renew our strength today? Would you give us fresh insight today? Would you help us see something of you in our world because we're seeing lots of other things? And, uh, and then deal with us inside today. Show us something that encourages us and challenges us, that lifts us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, we're in a series, starting a series today uh, in the topic of integrity, integrity. So when I use the word integrity, what comes to your mind? Uh, maybe you know someone who you consider a person of integrity and they just live a really healthy and loyal life and, and you've always been impressed by them. Or maybe it's a set of guidelines that kind of honor life and others and that's kind of what integrity means to you. Sometimes it's a strict code of conduct. And uh, so people who uh, lean into this definition, uh, you might hear them say things like this, well, I would never, and then they'll fill in the blank, with some option that they would hope they would never exercise in life. Uh, if, if you've heard of the word integer, it means a whole number. And so something that's not fractured but whole is a concept of integrity. Uh, people choose different options when they're facing pressure and pain in life. And sometimes under those circumstances, we wind up doing things we would not have imagined that we would do. If we base all of our decisions on trying to avoid pressure and pain in life, uh, what will wind up happening is we will miss out on a lot of life and we will mess up a lot of life. And so our goal in this conversation about integrity, and we're going to take a few weeks to unpack this. Uh, I'm not going to try to do it all in one message. Our goal in talking about integrity is to find the life that God intended. Now, there are people who would uh, never intentionally lie or cheat or take something that uh, they had not earned or, or uh, wasn't rightfully theirs or, or would refuse to honor a commitment they made like that. They, they live by a set of, of, of code and conduct in their life that that would be out of bounds for them. And if you ask them if they are people of integrity, they are likely to tell you that they work really hard to be. And if you ask their friends, are they people of integrity? Lots of their friends will say, yes, they really are. But for some people who keep all those rules, life doesn't seem to work very well. They seem to struggle over and over again with these debilitating realities. And their failures in those things is never identified as an integrity issue because they told the truth and they didn't take something that didn't belong to them. What if, what if there's more to integrity than just the rules we don't break or the promises we do keep? Maybe there's something more to it than that. So what kind of life does God intend for us? And the answer is, first of all, he intends that we experience a life of freedom. Like there's a kind of way to go about life that, that he desires for us, and it includes freedom, and it also includes this concept of love. 
So we're going to look at Galatians, the fifth chapter today. I'm going to begin in verse 13, and we're going to begin to unpack this concept that, that integrity might be more than we have defined it to this point in our lives. Uh, beginning in verse 13, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free. There we are, called to a free life. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. There's love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So freedom and love. So, of course, some people define freedom as the right to do anything you want to do. When you're really little, that's how you think adult life is. When, when you're entering in your teens, you think adults just get to do everything they want to do. So let's just check this morning. How many adults in the room get to do everything you want to do? No takers. Uh, how, how many uh, adults in this morning have a hard time just keeping up with the things you have to do? Like that's, that's challenging enough. Scripture defines freedom in this passage as the ability to serve others with humility. That's freedom. Now, we've all had an impulse to help someone or to participate in something, and we seemed unable to do it. The opportunity was there, the thought occurred to us, but something seemed to restrain us. And it's not because we, we lacked the time, it's because we were unwilling to take or make the time. It's not as though we lacked the resources. It was more of a resolve issue. Something, something held us back. We were not able to respond. Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was doubt. Maybe it was a sense of insecurity. But something restrained us in that moment. And we've all been faced with the opportunity to engage in something that we knew crossed a line. It was out of bounds in some way. And our impulse, like inside we go, I probably shouldn't do that. And then somehow we ignored that internal warning light. Our desires seem to override our discernment. Desire and love are not the same thing. They can coexist, but we often get them confused. Um, if you've ever had any kind of medical test, particularly, let's say that you, know, you may have broken a bone, uh, you can have x-rays taken and they can see if the bone is broken or not. You can't tell by looking outside, but they can actually see beneath the surface. And, and they have marvelous equipment that can do even higher detailed um, beneath the surface views than x-rays. There's CAT scans and MRIs and all this wonderful technology that lets you know if something is not right under the surface. And so the question is, do we have anything like that for us in terms of our emotional and spiritual health? What, what helps us see beneath the surface? And the answer is a little bit surprising. The answer is, is that it's our relationships. They are indicators of what's going on underneath the surface. And here's the challenge. We can actually live by a really high standard of values and still blow up a lot of relationships in our life. So what's going on? Well, we can start with this truth. Every single person has internal tensions. Uh, have you ever thought about this? I mean, if you've ever been on a diet, right? You made a decision in your mind that you wanted to lose a few pounds. And so you decided, starting whatever the time was, I'm going to eliminate certain things from my daily consumption with the hope that I will drop some weight. And maybe you even added some exercise uh, to that uh, effort. And so you were going to start walking or running or whatever it is, the form of skiing, uh, uh, snowboarding, something. You're going to do something to try to drop a few pounds. And, and then, then you'll be walking through the kitchen and there on the counter is, is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
disguised as a, a tray of chocolate chip cookies, right? And you just, you walk by and it's not like, sometimes we forget and just out of habit, we grab and then, oh, I, I can't believe I did that. But sometimes we don't do that. We walk by and we go. And what's going on inside? There's a part of us that's saying, leave those cookies alone. And there's a part of us that's saying, go ahead and have a cookie. How can you have two very different views inside of you? Which one of those is the real you? And the answer is both. What's happening is there's this little tiny fracture that's occurring in our life and integrity is being worn down because both things are true. We want to be healthier and we want to enjoy a cookie. And this happens to all of us. We all go through these kinds of things. There will be times when we are tempted to go places we should not go, to do things we should not do, to say things we should not say, and we do it. We, inside, something is saying, you shouldn't say that, and then we just go ahead and do it. And it's not just that. There are times when we are tempted to not go places we should go and to, and, and to, and to not do things that we should do and to not say things that we should say. And, and when those moments call for this kind of courage from us to, to lean in, to step up, to help out, to do something, this internal tension takes over. See, honoring rules is not an incorrect definition of integrity. It's an incomplete definition of integrity. There are opportunities that we didn't seize, that God brought to us. There are times when we couldn't express our love, times that we couldn't affirm our commitment, times that we couldn't humbly serve someone else. And in our lives, we rarely think of those things as integrity issues. But something in us is not whole. It's not on the same page. So there's, there's more to being a parent than just providing food and shelter. There's more to being a good spouse than just not going to the wrong bed at the end of the day. There's, there's more to being a good employer or employee than just showing up on time. Those issues are integrity issues too. So I'd like to try a definition. I actually heard, first heard this definition uh, more than 10 years ago from a guy who uh, co-authored the book Boundaries. His name is Henry Cloud. He also wrote a book called Integrity. And uh, I, I wanna say around 2006. And he came up with a definition of integrity that really has stuck with me through the years. And it's this, integrity is the ability to meet the demands of reality. Integrity is the ability to meet the demands of reality. Demands that we would often rather not deal with. I mean, sometimes you'll be frustrated with someone in your house and you will be tempted to raise your voice and shorten your vocabulary to like words that have four letters only. Uh, like, we all know that that shouldn't happen, but it does, doesn't it? But there are other times when we see something that needs to be addressed, maybe in the marriage relationship, maybe in the parent-child relationship, maybe with a friendship with someone else, and we know that if we addressed it, it would be better for the other person, but we also know it could strain the existing relationship and make life more difficult. And in those moments, we often fail to meet the demands of reality because reality is not calling for us to stand and watch that thing drift somewhere we don't want it to go, but to speak in, to stand up and do something. And that's part of the demands of reality too. So here's the thing, if we limit our idea of integrity to just good rule keeping, then you can be a really good rule keeper and there's some people who naturally are. Uh, if you're a firstborn, highly likely you are better at keeping the rules than the rest of the siblings that came along in the house, 
Right? It's just part of uh, the wiring that, that goes into people and, and, and the environments that we're raised in and, and what happens when parents are able to give all their attention to one child and have to distribute it among other children. And so here's the challenge. If I'm good at keeping rules, I can feel rather self-righteous while I'm failing to do things that, demand, that, that reality demands of me. And in that self-righteousness, what did Paul say? He said, you will bite and devour each other. You'll destroy each other. And you'll feel right. And, and that's not good. So he goes on to say this in Galatians 5, picking up in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. For the acts of the, uh, of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. When I ask people the kind of person they want to be, everyone is consistent in their responses. They want to be someone who's courageous. They want to be strong. They want to be wise. They want to be generous. They want to be confident. They want to be honest. They want to be dependable. They want to be consistent. They want to be uh, persistent. Like, th th everybody wants to be this kind of person. I've never had a person come to me and, when I ask that question and say, I want to be a lying, backstabbing, untrustworthy person in life. I've never heard that person say that. But there are lots of people who wind up that way. What's the undercurrent that gets us to go to and become something that we don't want to be? Every single day, we're, we're taking steps towards something. Maybe it's the person you dreamed you would be or the person that it was your nightmare you would become. Here's the thing to know is that our integrity is not a stagnant thing. We're, we're in process. We're moving one direction or another. And there'll come a time, uh, most of us don't like to think about this, but our time will come to exit this world and, and it will actually be our integrity that leaves the biggest impression on people's lives, not our accomplishments. I can actually begin to list names now, both in politics and in business and in religion, names of people who seemed as though they were accomplishing great things, and yet their integrity got in the way, and that is what they are most remembered for. Our integrity will determine the decisions that we make when we feel that internal tension. Some people think that spirituality is a way to remove the internal tension when actually spirituality is to help us choose wisely when we're experiencing that internal tension. So the good news is you can grow your integrity. It's not set in concrete. It's not cast in stone. Uh, maybe you've made choices where uh, you allowed freedom to be defined by temptation and lo love to be defined by pleasure. And, and while we cannot change our past, we can actually learn from our past. And we can discover a, 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 a desire for something other than just meeting our desires. Like that can be in us too. By the way, there are people in this room that you've been on the receiving end of someone else's lack of integrity. You carry the emotional and sometimes physical scars of someone who went way out of bounds and violated any sincere definition of that concept of integrity. And there's good news for every person in this room today. Your integrity is not unalterable or unchangeable. That your character 
lapses and your integrity lapses, that you can grow from that and out of that. And if you have been sinned against, whatever wounds have been brought into your life, you can be healed from that. Because of Jesus, you have options. They may not be easy, but they are possible because of his work in our lives. So we're not confused about what uh, uh, we want in others. We all want people who are honest with their words and their dealings with us. We want people who be loyal to us. We want people who know how to control themselves. We want people to be patient. We want people to be kind. We want people to be generous. Our confusion is not about what we want from others. Our confusion starts with when we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in a moment ourselves. That's where the tension begins to rise. So integrity is the ability to meet the demands of reality. And the Apostle Paul shows us what integrity looks like when it's missing. These, the list that he gave, this is some of the definitions of a, a repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental, emotional garbage, corrupting or perverting by promising something enjoyable, making something that's good an ultimate thing, manipulating others to get what you want, hostility, arguing, and constantly inserting controversy and conflict, ill feelings towards someone because they have what you want, brutal temper, getting others to serve you rather than trying to serve others, divided homes, divided lives, working to tear down larger things from within, depersonalizing others and turning them into rivals, uncontrolled addictions, unbridled indulgence. We are constantly confronted with people who've lived out those realities. They make the headlines and we watch the stories. We can't turn our eyes away. We're fascinated by what they did, but none of us want to live with that person. And yet we're capable, every one of us are capable of becoming that person. When we've learned painful lessons in life, one of the things we can do is we can share that. Um, I'm a dad, and I can tell you that I was most frustrated with my kids growing up when they were acting exactly like me. That happened to anybody besides me? Yeah. Just when they were being me, that just bugged me. And, and I would see times when they were considering options that weren't the best options. And it would annoy me because I exercised that option and I knew where it took me. And there were times when I would see them hesitate, when they could lean into an opportunity and they just lacked confidence or they, they lacked the, the, the belief in themselves that, that they could make this happen. And I'd watch them withdraw and I was frustrated because I've done those very things. And what would come out would not be a humble statement you know, I faced that one time too, or maybe multiple times. And this is the painful lessons that I learned about holding back when there was an opportunity or about crossing a line. I knew that wasn't good for me. But that's not what usually, usually what parents do. It's not usually what I did. I just, I was frustrated that they weren't exercising better options. And the Bible says that we learn to love in humility, serving others. And the humble thing is to acknowledge what the reality is. And the humble thing is to acknowledge what painful lessons I've learned. And the humble thing is to share those lessons, even though it may not make me look very good in that moment. Those are the things that can make all the difference in life. Humility is how you find reality and connect with it. And please understand this. Reality is always your friend, even if it's painful, because the only other option is fantasy. And you won't like where that takes you. It is not good. So the apostle shows us what life looks like when integrity is present. You have a genuine affection for others, an exuberance about life. You have serenity, a willingness to stick with things, compassion in the heart for others, conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. You have loyal commitments. You don't need to force your way. You marshal and direct your energies wisely. This is what makes a difference in life. You see, integrity is the ability to meet the demands 
of reality. It helps you integrate your life with others. Uh, how many actually came to church today in a car? Nobody walked or... I didn't see any horses out there, so I'm pretty sure we're past that. When, when, you, when you push the button or stick the key in the ignition and you turn it, those first couple of minutes of all the parts in the engine beginning to work take about the equivalent of 500 miles of driving off the wear and tear of the engine because the oil hasn't gotten into all the nooks and crannies of the engine yet. And thousands of pieces have been crafted meticulously with exacting proportions to make sure they work really well together. But if they don't have that oil in there, what happens is that friction begins to tear them apart. And please understand, we have been designed and created to do life together. But without the oil of integrity in our lives, the very things designed to work together will wind up tearing ourselves apart. So what's the biblical process for growing integrity? In Galatians 5, it says this, beginning in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Let me just break this down real quickly. Determine that passions and desires are not going to make your decisions. We need a better reason than I want it. We need to allow another voice to speak into our life. Otherwise, we'll just do a lot of rationalizing and pretending. We need to stop comparing ourselves with other people because when we do, we tend to compare ourselves with other people and assume that God made a mistake with us and we don't value his gifts, and we don't value his opportunities, and we don't value the talents that he's given to us. We devalue ourselves when we compare ourselves with each other. And don't stir up anger in yourself or others. Have you noticed our culture is, is excellent at stirring up anger? Experts at it. Anger is a necessary emotion. There are times when we absolutely need it, but we can wind up using it to manipulate or intimidate others. A lot of anger gets used to try to get someone else to do what I want them to do or not to do what I don't want them to do. But then he tells us, learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. His promptings will lead us to acts of generosity. He will encourage us to be loyal and faithful. He is the one who will reveal opportunities to step into. If we don't have that dependence on the Holy Spirit, we'll wind up missing out on a lot of life that God intended, and that's how we can learn to build a life of integrity. Integrity is the ability to meet the demands of reality. So if you do this, yes, there'll be people who think you're silly and foolish and naive. Yes, there are some people who will think it's funny. And yes, there are some people who will take advantage of you. If you live a life of integrity, those things will happen. But some other things will happen. If you live a life of integrity, you will have the deepest relationships and the greatest friendships. You will have riches that cannot be calculated on a ledger sheet. There will be future generations that will be glad that you were ever alive. You will have trust and respect of others. Life will actually work better. Let's bow our heads this morning. Anytime I, I address a topic like this, there's always the risk that when we're in the room hearing something like this, we see our shortcomings, and then we start this kind of beating ourselves up routine and guilt and shame becomes the primary emotion. And that is not the goal of this talk. I don't think that guilt actually makes you a better person. I think shame will drive you into the most unbelievable darkness of your life. But I think that in the midst of the darkness of this world, there can come these little pinpricks of light like stars in the middle of the night. And it gives us hope that there's something beyond the darkness and the current horizons that I see. And not just what is possible for me, but what is possible in me. 
And so what I want you to know today is that God doesn't love you any less because of what you have done or failed to do. But God also won't stay silent because he knows what's possible for your life. And so he wants to inspire, he wants to encourage, he wants to call us up, he wants to let us know we don't have to settle for what the world dishes out. That in the midst of all that is going on around us, a light can shine and we can become the person God intended us to be. And you and no one else in your life will ever regret that reality. So Father, wherever there's shame and guilt, will you allow a fresh flow of your forgiveness to flow through into our lives and flush all the remnant of that from us. Let us look to the opportunities that you present as a source of inspiration and encouragement. You have more for us than we have experienced and we want to find out what that is. In Jesus' name, amen.